Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand. True to our word, we are here to bring some clarity to a song of ice and fire. In parts one and two, we explained why we believe Aegon, also known as Young Griff, is actually the baby that was born at the Tower of Joy and is the prince that was promised. In part three, we will be telling you even more about Aegon. Specifically, we will be discussing some key sequences which illustrate his evolution as a character and drawing parallels to his Targaryen ancestry. As the Shy Maid continues its journey down the Rhoyne River, the mood becomes a little tense as they enter the Sorrows, a place known to be inhabited by stone men. Aegon is told to get below deck with Lamor, as everyone there is, quote, sworn to protect him. He refuses, stating that he's as good as duck with a sword, and he points out that Tyrion, a dwarf, is allowed to stay on deck. To which Tyrion replies, My secret is revealed, Tyrion agreed. I, I'm less than half of Halden, and no one gives a mummer's fart whether I live or die. Least of all me, he thought. You, though, you are everything. At which point, Aegon turns to Griff and says, He knows who I am. The blue hair makes your eyes seem blue. That's good. And the tale of how you color it in honor of your dead Taroshi mother was so touching it almost made me cry. Still, a curious man might wonder why some sellsword's whelp would need a soiled scepter to instruct him in the faith or a chainless maester to tutor him in history and tongues. A clever man might question why your father would engage a hedge knight to train you at arms instead of sending you off to apprentice with one of the free companies. It is almost as if someone wanted to keep you hidden whilst preparing you for... What? Now there's a puzzlement. But I'm sure that in time it will come to me. I must admit, you have noble features for a dead boy. What's important to note here is that Tyrion thinks that Aegon has noble features. But given the information he has, or is lacking, logically concludes that he is Rhaegar's son with Elia. However, as we already stated in previous videos, Aegon being the son of Elia and Rhaegar doesn't really make a lot of sense, and is therefore likely not the case. As their bantering continues, the boat is attacked by stonemen. Tyrion aids in protecting the now-revealed prince, and in the process is dragged into the water by one of the stonemen. When he awakens, he finds out that it was Griff who had saved him from drowning, and that it was Aegon who had then forbade the crew from throwing him back into the water. As a quick aside, the crew likely wanted to throw Tyrion back into the water because they thought it was very likely he had contracted Grayscale, a highly contagious mortal disease which would put everyone aboard the Shy Maid at risk. Shortly after learning about how Aegon had saved him from a life as a stone man, Aegon and Lamor emerge on deck. Tyrion sees that Aegon's in an agitated mood, as he was not allowed to go ashore with the others, and thinks... The perfect prince, but still half a boy for all that, with little and less experience of the world and all its woes. Tyrion then challenges Aegon to a game of Syvas and regales him with some of the wits and wisdom of Tyrion Lannister, and in the process begins killing the boy so the man can be born. As Aegon arrays his pieces at the start of the game, Tyrion thinks... A young man's formation, as bold as it is foolish. He risks all for the quick kill. And then he says, I would not do that if I were you. It's a mistake to bring your dragon out too soon. Your father knew the dangers of being overbold. As their game continues, Tyrion tells Aegon that he should not show up to his aunt, a beggar as she seems to be a proud, strong woman who has an army of her own, not to mention dragons. He also points out that Aegon's claim to the throne is stronger than hers, which could be an additional fly in the ointment. Aegon replies that he trusts Connington to win her over to their cause, to which Tyrion replies, 
Trust no one, my prince. Not your chainless maester, not your false father, not the gallant duck, nor the lovely Lamour, nor these other fine friends who grew you from a bean. Above all, trust not the cheesemonger, nor the spider, nor this little dragon queen you mean to marry. All that mistrust will sour your stomach and keep you awake by night, tis true. But better that than the long sleep that does not end. But what do I know? Your false father is a great lord, and I'm just some twisted little monkey man. Still, I'd do things differently. Tyrion ends up winning the match, which, turns out, is a direct result of Aegon listening to his advice at the start of the game. Aegon stares in astonishment at the Sivas board, and questions Tyrion about what he had said. Tyrion replies, I lied. Trust no one, and keep your dragon close. Furious, Aegon kicks over the Sivas board and demands Tyrion clean it up. As he abides the prince's orders, he thinks he may well be a Targaryen after all. Aegon then later reflects on the advice Tyrion had given him. As he and John Connington approach the Golden Company, he says, I like the sound of that. My army. A smile flashed across his face, then vanished. Are they, though? They're sellswords. Yolo warned me to trust no one. There is wisdom in that, Griff admitted. Not every man is what he seems. And a prince especially has good cause to be wary. But go too far down that road, and the mistrust can poison you, make you sour and fearful. You would do best to walk a middle course. Let men earn your trust with leal service. But when they do, be generous and open-hearted. The boy nodded and said, I will remember. By the time Connington and Aegon meet with the captains of the Golden Company, Aegon begins to quickly realize that the men have become disillusioned and are on the brink of abandoning his cause altogether. Connington's attempt to rally the men is an epic fail, at which point Aegon takes matters into his own hands. He seizes the moment and says, Then put your hopes on me. Daenerys is Prince Rhaegar's sister, but I am Rhaegar's son. I am the only dragon you need. If my aunt wants Marine, she's welcome to it. I will claim the Iron Throne by myself with your swords and your allegiance. Move fast and strike hard, and we can win some easy victories before the Lannisters even know that we have landed. That will bring others to our cause. When all of them began to speak at once, Griff knew the tide had turned. This is a side of Aegon he had never seen before. It is not the prudent course, but he was tired of prudence, sick of secrets, weary of waiting. Win or lose, he would see Griffin's roost again before he died, and be buried in a tomb beside his father's. One by one, the men of the Golden Company rose, knelt, and laid their swords at the feet of his young prince. With the ten thousand men of the Golden Company sworn to his cause, Aegon does just what he said he would. He went west instead of east, landed at Cape Wrath, and took Griffin's Roost, which is John Connington's family's ancestral home. After settling in, Connington tells some of the captains that it is time that Aegon was sent for as he would be safer behind the castle walls rather than at the camp with the men. Franklin Flowers, however, tells him that Aegon will not like that very much, as he seems to prefer being in the thick of things. A few days later, Aegon arrives, and Connington orders one of the men to escort him to his solar at once. To his dismay, he realizes that the boy Griff he had known in Essos was now a man not so eager to follow his orders. Prince Aegon Targaryen was not near as biddable as the young boy Griff had been. The better part of an hour had passed before he finally turned up in the solar with Duck at his side and said, Lord Connington, I like your castle. Now this seems like an innocuous statement that anyone might say when seeing someone's home for the first time. 
But something about the way Aegon said it makes Kyneton flash back twenty years to the time that he stood with Rhaegar on the battlements of Griffin's Roost, and how Rhaegar had said, Your father's lands are beautiful. In other words, both Rhaegar and Aegon said and did virtually exactly the same thing. When Connington tries to dismiss Duck from the Solar, Aegon insists he stay, which reminds John on how resolute Aegon had been about Duck being a member of his Kingsguard. He had tried his best to dissuade the prince from giving Duckfield that cloak, pointing out that the honor might best be held in reserve for warriors of greater renown whose fealty would add luster to their cause and the younger sons of great lords whose support they would need in the coming struggle, but the boy would not be moved. Duck will die for me if need be, he had said, and that is all I require in my king's guard. Aegon then asks Kyneton about his plan to attack Storm's End. Kyneton asks him if Harry Strickland, the captain general of the Golden Company, had asked him to delay it, to which Aegon replies, He did, actually, but I won't. You have the right of it, my lord. I want the attack to go ahead with one change. I mean to lead it. As our series on the prince that was promised comes to a close, I want to quickly review all that we have learned about Aegon, also known as Young Griff. 1. He's traveling with a group of people on the Shy Maid, most of which are using an alias and are presumed dead. 2. He's the real deal but not the son of Elia and Rhaegar, but the son of Lyanna and Rhaegar. 3. He looks the part, not only because he has Targaryen features, but because he's described by Tyrion as being really, really ridiculously good-looking, similar to the way that Cersei remembers Rhaegar being the most beautiful man she had ever seen. 4. He is good at everything he does, just like Rhaegar. 5. His story very much parallels the tale of Egg from the Duncan Egg stories. Both of them grow up concealing their true identities from the world around them. Both wear straw hats. Both are good kids. Both of them befriend a hedge knight whom they later appoint to their king's guard and spend most of their formative years living amongst the common people. Additionally, Egg's mother was a Dane, and Septa Lamour, the woman who is the closest thing Aegon has to a mother, is very likely a Sharadane, which will be further explained in our next video. However, there is one distinction between the two. When Maester Aemon tells John about his brother Aegon, he indicated that Egg had an innocence to him that persisted well into adulthood, whereas Aegon, the sixth of his name, quickly evolves into the man he needs to be. When George R. R. Martin was asked for his thoughts on Aegon, he replied, I have plenty of thoughts about Aegon. So before we end, we thought it would be fitting to conclude with George R. R. Martin's last thoughts about Aegon that he has shared with us, which can be found in the epilogue of A Dance with Dragons. As Kevin Lannister lays dying after being shot by Varys, Varys explains to him why he had to meet such a tragic end and perfectly articulates all that needs to be said about Aegon. So, here it is. Aegon has been shaped to rule since before he could walk. He has been trained in arms as befits a knight to be, but that was not the end of his education. He reads and writes, he speaks several tongues, he has studied history and law and poetry. A scepter has instructed him in the mysteries of the faith since he was old enough to understand them. He has lived with fisher folk, worked with his hands, swum in rivers, mended nets, and learned to wash his own clothes at need. He can fish and cook and bind up a wound. He knows what it is like to be hungry, to be hunted, to be afraid. Toman has been taught that kingship is a right. Aegon knows that kingship is his duty, that a king must put his people first and live and rule for them.